Good afternoon and welcome to our series of webinars focused on bringing you information about COVID-19 related topics. The information in these weekly webinars is geared toward long-term care and skilled nursing facilities, but we encourage everyone who is interested to attend. Today, we will be continuing our discussion about long-term COVID in nursing homes, this week focusing on quality measures. Everyone will be on mute, but if you have any questions, enter them into the chat and we will address them at the end of the webinar. We encourage you to join our webinars every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Next week, we will be wrapping up our three-part our three part discussion on long-term COVID and Patty will be back next week to talk more about quality measures. My name is Kathy Caudill. I'm a communication specialist with Quality Insights. And now I would like to introduce our guest today, Patty Austin. Patty is a quality improvement specialist at Quality Insights. She has been working in the skilled nursing arena for the past 29 years. After starting her career as a nursing assistant and leaving the front lines as a director of nursing, the variety of perspectives that Patty has enables her to see the big picture that helps nursing facilities create lasting change within their communities. Patty has been with Quality Insights since 2016, and she considers it a privilege to be able to interact with so many different facilities on a variety of topics each day. Patty, welcome and thank you for joining us today to talk about quality measures in relation to long COVID. And if you're ready, you can take it away. Thanks so much, Kathy. And hi, everybody. Very nice to be here with you today to talk about a not very nice topic, long COVID and its impact on our facilities. Many of you may have heard our presentation on this syndrome last week. And while that information was most certainly vitally important to understand, we now need to take that knowledge and apply it to our settings. By doing this, we place ourselves in the best position we can to continue to navigate these new waters we find ourselves in. Long COVID is much like COVID itself was when it first made its appearance. We knew it was there, but we didn't really understand a whole lot about it. We weren't sure how it was transmitted, the best way to treat it, or what to do if we were faced with an outbreak. And when it comes to long COVID, we kind of find ourselves in that very same boat. We know our population is at greater risk for developing that constellation of symptoms that we refer to as long COVID, but there's not really a test to confirm it confirm it, and there's no standard definition for it, and we can't predict who's going to fall victim to it. So we're really kind of up in the air. What we do know is that some studies point to 32% of people 65 and older presenting with symptoms of long COVID. That number is almost double that of those younger than 65. We know that the symptoms can be easily overlooked as they mimic the progression of previously diagnosed conditions. And we know that sometimes they can be written off as what people mistakenly consider a normal, normal part of aging. We know that when looking at seriously or chronically ill residents, that those symptoms might present in the same way that long COVID symptoms present. And we know that the impact of long COVID is significant when it comes to issues like quality of life. As the medical community itself continues to learn more about this new wrinkle in the COVID cloth, we again find ourselves in a position to mitigate the risk brought to our residents. We take a really high level look at some of the symptoms that we see when we're talking about long COVID we can begin to set a course to navigate them in the best way that we can. None of the symptoms are unique to COVID and are indeed the very things that we deal with on a daily basis. Things like fatigue and sleep disturbance and shortness of breath, maybe muscle and joint pain, issues surrounding concentration and attention or memory and language. None of those things are uncommon in our world. So you might be wondering, why do we even need to talk about long COVID at all? These things are our bread and butter. We deal with them all day, every day, 24 seven. And yes, they are things that we deal with every day. However, 
attention still needs to be given to this new subset of people so that we're addressing every possible avenue available to us to lessen the risk and promote our residents' highest level of function. One way to do that might be to view COVID through the lens of quality measures. And that's what we're going to focus on over the next two sessions. The symptoms that we have mentioned can have a large impact on several quality measures. You know what, I would actually venture to say most quality measures. So without a proactive plan in place, we find that we are potentially leaving ourselves open to decreasing quality measure scores, and more importantly, leaving things on the table that are going to improve the quality of life for our residents. So there are many ways that we can begin to categorize and tackle the topic as a whole. The ways that, that things fall into place for me might not be the way they fall into place for your team. And as we move through today, remember that the important thing is to have a plan that fits your building and your residence. As I was preparing for spending this time for you today or with you today, a few natural groupings seem to develop. Things that linked long COVID symptoms to quality measures. And then as I even took that to a higher level view, two kind of umbrella areas seem to develop. The first thing to jump out at me is how many of the symptoms that we're talking about relate to the potential to increase a resident's risk of falls. And the second thing to kind of make itself known to me was how many things can directly relate right back to pain. So for the rest of our time today, we're gonna to take a look at falls and we're gonna save pain for a future discussion. We know that fall risk is a huge topic, even when we don't have long COVID thrown into the mix. Chances are good that we all have strong fall prevention practices in place already. And that means that finally we don't need to reinvent the wheel and we have a strong foundation. We just need to look at things a little bit differently for those of our residents who are recovering from COVID. It's safe to say that all recovering residents should be considered a high risk for falls, regardless of their status prior to COVID until we can show that, that to be otherwise. We know that the devastation that a fall can bring to our healthiest residents is significant. So let's take a look at some of the data provided by the CDC and consider its impact on our communities. One of five falls leads to serious injury. We know that hip fractures are the most common serious injury resulting from falls in our setting. We also know that many studies exist that show the correlation between hip fractures and mortality rates in the elderly. One such study published by Acta Orthopodica relates that over 320,000 hip fractures occur in North America every year, and they're associated with a mortality rate ranging from 14 to 36% within one year of surgery. So if we continue down that path, we might have a resident who say contracts COVID in January, and then long COVID is assumed in March. In April, she falls and unfortunately breaks a hip and undergoes surgery. Sadly, that resident becomes part of the 14 to 32% of post-surgical patients to die within a year. She passes away in September. So we have gone from a relatively healthy pre-COVID resident, maybe planning a discharge home, to a resident who has passed away all in the short span of six months. Maybe a little less extreme point might be that 3 million ER trips every year are related to falls. And that number is huge and it relates directly to the more than 800,000 hospitalizations for fall related injury every year. And that equates to more than $50 billion in medical costs. Those are some scary numbers, and that's even before we talk about the added risk that those hospital trips and the COVID exposure bring right back to our doorstep. 
So it's easy to see why we want to do everything in our power not to let long COVID impact our fall rates. So let's take a look at some of the symptoms of long COVID and how they might impact those fall rates. We kind of have the perfect storm when we consider sleep disturbance, fatigue, and shortness of breath, don't we? Residents who were able to function at a certain level pre-COVID might now be quite debilitated. You might want to consider things like therapy screens post-COVID. This is going to enable you to identify those residents who have experienced changes in ability and adjust care plans accordingly. This will most likely go beyond just that PT screen and into the OT realm as well. The ability to ambulate the same number of feet is only one small part of what we're looking for. Those with long COVID may now struggle with tasks that were once very simple. Things like putting on a sweater or even something as mundane as opening a tea bag might simply be exhausting for those residents now. The fatigue that comes to an arm when it's brushing teeth might now be a factor that didn't exist before. So careful attention needs to be given so that we simply don't say, hey, they had COVID, they're over it, let's move on, life goes on. We have to be sure that we're continuously assessing the road being traveled back to that pre-level, pre-COVID level of function, or we risk the walk to the bathroom being just a little bit too long and leading to a fall or the exertion required to put that sweater on causing a balance disturbance that leads to a fall with injury. Extreme fatigue that is going to be experienced by many of our long COVID residents automatically places them at a higher risk for falls. And that is sometimes very easy to overlook. Energy conservation techniques will become an important part of the plan of care and should not only be considered when you're educating your residents, but your staff and your families will also benefit from learning those techniques so that they can support your residents. This is not only going to reduce the risk of falling, but it's also going to help you to improve quality of life for those residents. Consider that you might need to do some simple things like increase the number of rest places available to your residents on those commonly traveled pathways within the facility. A once very easy walk to the activity lounge may now need to be broken into several shorter walks. The cognitive issues that are so prevalent in long COVID further complicate fall risk factors. Acute attention should be given to any sign of cognitive decline. That rest area that was easily identified yesterday might be just overlooked today. There are reports that unlike dementia, long COVID cognitive decline has a more abrupt onset. Some people have described feeling like the decline happened overnight. And for that reason, remaining vigilant on a daily basis is going to be imperative. The final takeaway on long COVID as it relates to falls is that we need to be both proactive and reactive when considering ways to prevent falls. Proactively discussing the possibility of these symptoms occurring with newly recovered COVID residents will allow a plan of care to be initiated with the participation of those residents and families. Remaining alert and reactive to any changes in ability is going to allow you to modify those care plans to keep your residents safe. As always, knowledge is power. As people recover from COVID, we tend to put that part away and consider it done. <coughs> Excuse me. If we as a care team are aware of the potential complications, and our residents are engaged in planning for those complications, we're gonna find ourselves in a position to reduce the risk of falls and all of the negative consequences they bring with them, as well as in a position to permit the best possible quality of life for our residents who've already been through so very much. 
So next week, when we take a closer look at muscle and joint pain as a long-term COVID symptom, we will talk about just a myriad of areas and quality measures that that brings with it. And I'm really looking forward to digging into that with you a bit. But for now, I'm going to turn things back over to Kathy and address any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks, Patty. So in a minute, we will start the Q&A portion of this meeting. If you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat or the Q&A box. And while we're waiting, I'd again like to remind everyone that our next webinar will be a continuation of today's discussion on long COVID. As Patty said, she'll be back again next week discussing quality measures and long COVID. And uh, that will be next Wednesday at 2 p.m. We also host office hours live chats twice a week. So if you are looking for one-on-one -on -one advice for your facility, you can pop in during our office hours and shoot us a message and someone will be there to answer your questions. Those are every Tuesday at 8 a.m. and every Thursday at 2 p.m. You can find the links to those live chats and our webinars in the newsletter that we send out each Friday called the Last Minute Lowdown. And if you would like to receive that newsletter, but don't think you're on the uh, mailing list, you can email me at ccaudill at qualityinsights.org and I will get you on that list. And I will also drop my email into the chat shortly in case you did not catch that. Um, and then you can also email me today if you would like me to send you a recording of today's webinar. And now I will check to see if there are any questions. I've got a question that says, uh, I'm curious if any nursing home staff have identified long COVID symptoms that may have impacted their residents? I'm not positive I understand the question. Um, I'll read I, that again though, since it says, I'm, I'm curious if any nursing home staff have identified long COVID symptoms that may have impacted their residents. I'm not positive whether the viewer is asking whether or not staff is experiencing long COVID or if we are identifying long COVID within the nursing home setting. So I will address both of those areas briefly and hopefully I'll hit on um, the intent of the question. Yeah. Another so, question, uh, it says you mentioned cognitive decline. Can you be a bit more specific? Um, yes. Okay. So to get jump back to the first question, just for a, a mm, minute. Sorry. Um, I, that's okay. I don't think that we are hearing a lot in our setting right now about our staff members experiencing long COVID. However, um, the data does tell us that there are a portion of our staff members who would experience those kinds of symptoms. Um, the more significant or severe the COVID episode itself was, the more likely your staff would be to um, be at risk for experiencing those symptoms. Um, and I'm sure that that's something we're gonna be talking about as we move forward and learn more and more about this. As far as whether or not facilities are identifying long COVID within their settings, I think it's something that we are really just beginning to take a closer look at and trying to differentiate between those things like natural disease progression um, versus long COVID. And as we said, there are no definitive tests that are gonna tell you one way or another. Sometimes it simply is time. Um, so I think as we move forward, that question may be easier to answer. I'm sorry, I didn't have a real good answer for you right now. That's okay. And uh, she followed up to say, she was actually asking others on the call in the chat if they, if they awesome. have, so yeah, this is actually for our listeners, not for us now that I, That's so, yeah. awesome. so our listeners, if you have uh, answers to, to Penny's question, feel free to chime in. Um, and you know, I would love to um, hear her experience. If she's seeing anything like that in her facility, if she mm -hmm. wants to put that into the chat, I'd love to hear it. And I'm sorry, Kathy, I don't remember the next question. The next question is you mentioned cognitive decline. Can you be a bit more specific? Sure. Um, cognitive decline as it relates to COVID is speaking to memory loss, confusion, issues surrounding language, as well as what's commonly called brain fog. So 
all of those have been reported by post-COVID patients. And while not officially diagnosed as dementia, those symptoms can present just like dementia. The main difference is rather than being insidious and progressing slowly, they kind of just seem to appear at a fairly significant level at times. So we're also now seeing some reports that those long COVID cognitive issues may end up resulting in an actual dementia diagnosis for some of our residents. And for others, the cognitive decline seems to resolve over time. Again, being both proactive and reactive in the care planning process is going to be important in navigating those kind of deep waters as well. Next question. You said we would be talking about muscle and joint pain as a symptom next week. That seems to tie in with falls, doesn't it? It absolutely does. Pain impacts many, many different quality measures, things like falls, absolutely all of the ADL measures, pressure ulcers. Heck, I'll even pull out the old depression measure, um, even though it's not an official measure anymore, absolutely will be impacted by pain. When you consider the potential to add things like opiates as a pain treatment into the equation, things are even getting a little more sticky and more complex. We're gonna have a very full plate next week. All right, got another question. I think this might be our last one unless anyone else has one that they wanna put in the chat. Um, I had a resident discharged to a home and wind up as a readmit within 30 days due to sudden onset of confusion. She had recently recovered from COVID. How can I tell if this is a new dementia or a long COVID symptom? Hmm. Well, I really wish I had an answer for that for you. Don't feel like I'm hitting uh, batting a thousand on the answers today. Um, because there is no definitive test for long COVID, conversations with, no, with those people that kind of know her best and the physicians, both in the community and at your facility who are involved with her care, um, are going to provide you a lot of insight into what might be going on, as well as, again, time. Sometimes we're just going to have to wait and see how things develop. And those are really the only things we have available to us at the moment. However, an important thing to consider is educating your residents who are post-COVID prior to discharge what they may experience as it relates to long COVID after discharge, even if they're not experiencing symptoms when they leave you. That might help you to prevent an avoidable hospitalization or even a fall with injury. And again, we go back to that knowledge is power mantra. So I hope that was helpful. All right, I think that's it for questions. If you want to contact Patty directly, you can reach her at 1-800-642-8686 and enter extension 7633. You can also email her at paustin at qualityinsights.org. And you can check out our other interviews by visiting qualityinsights.org slash QIN slash multimedia. Patty, thank you for joining us today. And thank, thank you everyone Ryan. here. Thank you all for joining us.